Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, some people are still filing in, but um, we can get started straight away. And it's a great pleasure to invite Charlie Evans, who's the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago here, and he's been in that job now for precisely 15 years. Uh, if, you and Jim Bullard, I reckon, you must be among the very, very few monetary policy makers who've been around and had the fortune or, or the bad fortune to be around at the time of the 2007-2008 crisis, the onset of COVID, and now, of course, the unrest which has been unleashed by the war in Ukraine. So you've certainly won your spurs over that time. Uh, and also, a little statistic that I should put in for those lovers of cricket, uh, your batting average over the last 15 years has not been bad, because I believe the inflation rate in the United States has been below 2% for at least 13 of those. 15 years, but your 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 current performance, the Fed's performance, of course, is not so good. Eight and a half percent inflation. So, looking forward very much to what you have to say about all this. Uh, all of this is on the record, and then there'll be questions afterwards. So, Charlie, I'd just like you to take the floor and, and take it away. Tell us how it is. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I'd like to take a moment off my thoughts. Years of long service, steadfastness, and dedication. Um, during times of great change, were highly respected worldwide. Uh, the world's lost a most distinguished citizen. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, adding average, yes, I suppose that's right. Um, something about your remarks were reminiscent of uh, President Trichet towards the last day was when he was kind of saying, and we didn't know that two was the right number, but it looks like 1.7, it's going to average, maybe 1.8, uh, 9.8 or something like that. Yeah, I don't want to get too caught up in that. Um, I, last time I was invited to speak here in London was in October, 2018. Back then, central bankers around the globe were grappling with inflation that had been too low for quite a long time. And my remarks focused on the need for the Federal Open Market Committee to revise our monetary policy framework in order to counter what appeared to be entrenched impediments, keeping inflation persistently below our 2% inflation objective. Well, almost four years later, the economic landscape looks different. In the US and elsewhere around the world, what began as narrowly concentrated shocks to relative prices has spread turning into broad-based increases in overall inflation to levels far above every central bank's target. Accordingly, monetary policymakers now are significantly tightening policy in order to bring inflation back in line with their price stability mandates. In the United States, since March 2022, the FOMC has increased the federal funds rate, our main policy tool, by three percentage points, 300 basis points. We're we also are reducing the size of our balance sheet at a relatively rapid clip. In order to return inflation to the committee's 2% average goal, I expect we will need to raise rates further and then to hold that stance for a while. Of course, the exact path forward for policy will depend on the evolution of the economy and risk to the outlook. My talk today will describe my thinking behind this path in more detail. And before I begin, I am obliged to remind you that the views I share with you today are my own and do not necessarily represent those of my colleagues on the FOMC or others in the Federal Reserve System. The incoming data on the U.S. economy have been mixed with moderating spending, but quite strong labor demand. Following a robust recovery in 2021, gross domestic product in the U.S. fell over the first half of 2022. Recent indicators point to softness in consumption and business investment, as well as a large decline in activity in the housing sector. Lower real disposable income and tighter financial conditions are clearly in play. This is most notable in interest rate sensitive housing markets where mortgage rates have about doubled since the beginning of the year. In contrast to the spending data, the labor market has remained very strong. Furthermore, household and business balance sheets look pretty healthy. Considering all of the various indicators and factoring in recent and prospective changes in financial conditions, I expect modest increases in GDP over the second half of this year. I'll get into some specifics about the numbers in a few minutes. First, though, it's important not to lose sight of how we got here. 
Through two plus years of grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic and other disruptions, the economy has shown an impressive ability to adjust and carry on. By the second quarter of 2021, activity in the U.S. had surpassed its pre-pandemic level. In the labor market, after peaking near an astonishing 15% early in the pandemic, the unemployment rate in the U.S. declined quickly. Despite the recent slowdown in GDP, the labor market remains extremely tight. Job growth has been strong. And at just 3.7% in August, the unemployment rate is only a bit above the very low level we experienced before the COVID crisis. Furthermore, unfilled job openings at businesses and the rate at which people quit their jobs for other opportunities remain extraordinarily high. However, over the past couple of months, we've heard more reports of reduced job turnover and that some firms are finding it easier to attract qualified workers. These are signs that some of the unusual strength in labor demand may be cooling. Increasing pay and more flexible work arrangements may be part of the explanation, as well as the softer growth in spending I noted earlier. On the labor supply side, while many workers who left the labor force during the pandemic have re-entered the labor market, many others have not, and today labor force participation is still well below its pre-pandemic rate. Most of this shortfall is accounted for by older workers. Of course, aging baby boomers would have eventually retired, but the pandemic appears to have accelerated their exit from the labor force. Another factor weighing on labor supply is the quite low inflow to the U.S. labor force from immigration. A strong labor market may help draw some of those sitting on the sidelines back into the workforce and alleviate some labor market pressures. But as time passes, I become less optimistic that this labor supply channel will be very large indeed. The labor force participation rate currently does not appear far from its long run trend. I do, however, expect less accommodated monetary policy to be an important factor in dampening very high labor demand and bringing supply and demand conditions in the labor market into better balance over time. This brings me to a discussion of what is the principal issue facing the economy in the U.S. and elsewhere, inflation. Fed's preferred inflation gauge is the annual change in the Price Index for Personal Consumption Expenditures, PCE. After more than a decade of missing our average 2% target to the downside, PCE inflation has risen quite quickly. From under 1% in mid-2020 to 6.3% in the most recent July data. With food and energy prices excluded, so-called core PCE prices rose 4.6% over the past 12 months. So what's behind these rapid increases? Some of these increases are directly related to the pandemic. Earlier in the pandemic, with many people forced or choosing to spend more time at home, households shifted their spending from services, such as travel or dining out, toward goods, such as appliances for home improvement projects or consumer electronics. Many goods producing businesses struggled to keep pace with the strong demand, particularly as they faced COVID-related disruptions in production and supply chains. Labor shortages due to a broad-based drop in labor force participation were part of the story, too. In the U.S., these factors first showed through to inflation in early 2021 as overall activity began to normalize. Prices rose sharply for goods that were especially sensitive to supply chain problems and for services that were just beginning to reopen from the pandemic shutdowns. But these factors are not the entire story. I believe that the April 2021 FOMC statement was the first that sort of mentioned the inflation issues, just to put that into perspective. Beginning last autumn, price pressures began to build more broadly. At first, price increases for goods spread beyond those items most directly impacted by pandemic dynamics. Higher inflation then extended to a wide range of services, including rent and owner's equivalent rent, which account for a significant portion of household spending and where price increases tend to be rather persistent once they get going. Overall, the broad-based nature of these increases is a sign of widespread general demand pressures on the productive capacity of the economy. Of course, higher inflation is plaguing other industrialized economies as well. The U.S. experience is roughly in the middle of the pack. Here in the UK, for example, the consumer price index increased almost 10% over the past year. And across Europe, the readings have been similarly high. 
Our differences in individual countries' inflation experiences, increases in durable goods prices contributed more to inflation in the U.S. than in other OECD countries for which the comparable data are available, while rapid increases in food and energy prices intensified by the ongoing war in Ukraine were more important factors in the U.K. and many other industrialized economies. Even though the experiences differ, the rapid increase in inflation has created similar challenges across the world for consumers whose incomes may not have kept pace with rising prices and for monetary policymakers who are tasked with stabilizing prices. Though the recent inflation data have been disappointing, most forecasters, myself included, anticipate that inflation in the U.S. will cool down substantially over the next couple of years. Let me explain the reasoning behind my forecast. Much of the same logic applies to other industrialized economies as well, though there undoubtedly will be differences depending on the particular circumstances faced by each. First, even though some problems still remain, there are a number of signs that supply chain difficulties are improving. Ports are less congested, freight costs are falling, and supplier delivery times are improving. But all is not well yet, for example, for quite a while, a shortage of microprocessors held back the production of motor vehicles. While the chip shortage seems to be largely resolved, but shortages of other parts are now reportedly limiting assemblies. In turn, the problems at the part suppliers appear related to difficulties they are still having in staffing production lines. Over time, we will see supply chains further repaired. We will also see consumption return to more normal patterns. In the US, we may also see some further recovery in labor force participation, though, as I mentioned, I think the prospects for this are limited. As these supply side improvements occur, price pressures will diminish somewhat. Admittedly, these adjustments are taking much longer than I expected. And disruptions from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and unpredictable COVID-related shutdowns, notably in China, have continued to snarl supply. But eventually, these adjustments will occur. They are the hallmark of an economy in which price and wages, prices and wages provide the signals that guide resources to their most productive and profitable uses. Second, tighter monetary policy plays a very important role in my forecast of lower inflation. It is needed to pull back on aggregate demand and keep it from pushing too hard on today's still challenged supply conditions. It is also needed to prevent current large price increases from becoming embedded in pricing dynamics and longer run inflation expectations. Inflation will be much more difficult to rein in if households and businesses start thinking outsized increases in wages and prices are the new norm and incorporate those expectations into their decision making. At shorter time horizons, measures of inflation expectations picked up a lot beginning early last year as people took notice of the higher prices they've been encountering. They come down some lately with lower energy prices, but they still remain quite elevated. But the good news is that in general, measures of longer horizon inflation expectations have remained within a range that is consistent with our 2% inflation objective. This is true in most surveys, or on the compensation for inflation that's priced into financial market assets, suggesting households and businesses see the primary drivers of inflationary pressures as being short lived. Now, these perceptions can change and aren't something we can take for granted. I believe the Federal Reserve's strong policy actions and communications have played an important role in anchoring long run inflation expectations by demonstrating and conveying our commitment to bring inflation back into line with our 2% average objective. The public and markets appear to believe we will be successful, but it is up to us to follow through and do our job. Reducing inflation to a level consistent with the Fed's 2% objective will require a period of restrictive financial conditions. These will generate below trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions and restore better balance between supply and demand conditions in the United States. My FOMC colleagues and I are acutely aware that this slowdown will, unfortunately, cause difficulties for some households and businesses, yet failing to restore price stability would result in far greater costs. So with this in mind, what comes next for monetary policy? Last week, the FOMC voted to raise the federal funds rate by 75 basis points, 
to a range of three to three and a quarter percent and indicated that further rate increases will likely be in order. Also, as previously announced in September, we stepped up the pace at which we're reducing the size of our balance sheet. So how much more tightening might be necessary? One way to get gauge this comes from the committee's quarterly summary of economic projections released last week, which presents FOMC participants forecasts of key economic variables over the next three to four years and for the longer run. David, I believe I've talked about the SCP in previous uh, gatherings. Here. I'm a fan of it, yes. Uh, the median SEP projection is for the federal funds rate to be in the range of four and a quarter to four and a half percent by the end of this year. Though I would note almost as many FOMC participants wrote down four to four and a quarter percent for the end of year numbers. So most, most think we're looking at something like 100 to 125 basis points of rate increases this calendar year. The median projection then has rates rising a bit further to 4.6% at the end of next year, and then declining to 2.9% over the subsequent two years. My own viewpoint is roughly in line with the median assessment. How should we benchmark this policy path? Here, it's useful to think of where real or inflation-adjusted rates are relative to some benchmark of neutrality. When making economic decisions, people naturally think about the future. With the median federal funds rate projected to be 4.4% by the end of the year, and with core inflation next year forecast to be 3.1%, the real federal funds rate would be something like 1.3%. This is above the quarter to a half a percent range most FOMC participants see as the long run real neutral rate. And so by this calculation, this is clearly a restrictive setting. And though the estimates are subject to a great deal of uncertainty, the reduction in our balance sheet is worth something like an additional 35 to 50 basis points of policy restraint. Given that the funds rate was essentially at zero just seven months ago, this has been quite a pivot in monetary policy. In light of this expeditious repositioning, and because the full effect of tighter financial conditions takes time to show through to output and inflation, at some point, it will be appropriate to slow the pace of rate increases and eventually let policy rates sit at a plateau for a while in order to assess how our policy adjustments are affecting the economy. As always though, rates are not on a preset course. The FOMC will react to changes in the economic landscape as they occur and will adjust policy accordingly in order to achieve our goals of full employment and price stability. I know some are uncomfortable with the idea that the Fed provides projections for policy rates in the SEP, knowing that ultimately we will see a different path for rates if economic conditions or risks turn out otherwise. Some say this is a good reason not to provide such projections at all. I strongly disagree with this view. How could it be a bad thing to reveal how we see the base case scenario playing out? Think how much uncertainty and costly volatility we would have unnecessarily generated this past year if we'd not augmented our policy moves with guidance about our plans for the ultimate level of the federal funds rate. Indeed, in this rate cycle, the information in the SEPs and other Fed communications likely has strongly assisted in tightening financial conditions quickly and substantially without the large dislocations and financial flows that have at times accompanied past changes in the trajectory of policy. There was no taper tantrum this time, back in 94 and 95, when we increased rates by 300 basis points over 12 months, we had only started to announce that the meeting had actually ended and we had taken an action. So I think this was better. So what does all of this mean for the US outlook for growth, employment and inflation? Let us return to the FOMC summary of economic projections. For GDP growth, the median projection for this year is only 0.2%, which is consistent with growth averaging only about 1.5% over the second half of the year. Growth is projected at 1.2% in 2023, below the one and three quarters percent most see as the underlying trend. So monetary restraint is clearly showing through in these numbers. Real GDP growth is expected to return to trend in 2024 and 25. 
Under this GDP forecast, the unemployment rate is projected to rise to 4.4% by late 2023 and remain near that level in 24 and 25. While this does represent a noticeably softer labor market when compared to today's, we are not looking at recession-like numbers. Indeed, the peak projected unemployment rate is less than a half a percentage point above where the FOMC sees the unemployment rate settling at over the longer run. As for inflation with supply side improvements, restricted monetary policy and below trend growth, I expect inflation will moderate significantly. After all, that's the goal. According to the median SEP, after ending this year at 5.4%, total PCE inflation is expected to fall to 2.8% next year and 2.3% in 24, before returning to our 2% target by the end of 25. So let me conclude. Of course, all forecasts are subject to a great deal of uncertainty and risks. And unfortunately, many of those risks appear to be on the downside. Supply side repair could continue to move too slowly. Events in Ukraine or further COVID related shutdowns could put additional pressure on costs. And monetary policy may, on the one hand, not rein inflation in enough, or on the other hand, weigh too heavily on employment. So we must be watchful and ready to adjust our policy stance if changes in economic circumstances dictate. In sum, I can assure you that we will always set policy with the goal of progressing toward our dual mandate objectives of maximum inclusive employment and price stability as expeditiously as possible. Today, inflation is our primary concern. Reducing inflation is likely to require a sustained period of low trend growth, and there will most likely be some softening of labor market conditions. But this is necessary to restore inflation to our 2% target. Low and stable inflation is a prerequisite for achieving the kind of sustained, strong labor market outcomes that bring benefits to everyone in our society. We hope to achieve this goal as quickly and efficiently as possible. Thank you very much. Look forward to the conversation after this. Thanks very much, uh, Charlie. And uh, I'm struck by your comment about how this time you didn't have any taper tantrums. Because in this country, of course, in Britain, we're perfectly capable of using <laughs> tantrums by ourselves. We don't actually need the Federal Reserve to do that. We, we can do that all homemade. Um, just a couple of questions for me, uh, and then we'll open up to the audience, because all of this is uh, on the record as has been your whole speech. Um, just in how we got here, and you've made the remark that we are moving to restrict this. You made the remark about the, the real federal funds rate being above what is generally likely to be neutral next year. Is the fact that you are moving into an overtly restricted policy partly a function of the fact that you started too late? And would you use the word mistake to say, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we did start without tightening too late. We misjudged the situation last year. I'll, I'll switch well, you on so everybody can hear. Well, I mean, it, it's certainly fair to say that we misjudged the situation in the sense that, you know, knowing what I know now, if I, you know, uh, had a chance to go back and redo it, yes, I probably would have started earlier. I think um, part of, um, you know, the playbook that we were using in terms of uh, asset purchases and the funds rate sort of lent itself to a certain pattern, and uh, we gave the, um, the economy and the um, inflation data time to show what we thought were more temporary supply side effects um, on inflation. That turned out to be wrong. So, so that, that was that was a misjudgment. But uh, you know, when it first started out, so February 2022, the CPIs reported at 7.9%. Previous 12 months, it uh, in 21, it was 1.7%. So that's why I say April of 21 was the first FOMC announcement where we kind of said, yeah, you know, used car prices, uh, vehicle prices, the relative prices, prices are, are going up. They appear to be transitory. Um, you know, thinking that the semiconductor problem would be solved more quickly didn't work out that way. The COVID complications in factories in Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, COVID lockdowns uh, you know, perpetuated that. Um, who would have guessed that the auto company semiconductors were low margin chips and when all of a sudden everybody wanted uh, uh, consumer electronics, they probably spent more effort uh, on that. But yes, um, that sort of uh, happened um, 
went on, you know, longer. So and, and is that one of the reasons why you have to stand a little bit more firmly on the bricks this time around to make up for lost time? I, I suppose that, um, look, I mean, like I say, we have increased the federal funds rate in the last seven months by 300 basis points, and then 94, 95, it took us 12 months to do that. I think we've done it uh, very quickly, expeditiously. If we had started earlier, I would have been surprised if we were higher than where we are uh, now. Would the ultimate inflation increase have been uh, higher? I'm, I'm not quite so sure because the supply effects were notable. And I think that uh, one way or another, labor has been uh, in such a short supply that labor has had more um, uh, power to generate wage increases and, and things like that. But I mean, yes, you know, I think we, whatever slow start we may have gotten, I think we've certainly uh, recovered from that and you know, kind of leading the pack now. Just to get a on from now on in, I know you're, you're going to be perhaps not an, <coughs> a, a, a commentator, but you won't be part of the FNC after January. You, you've, you've had your last voting meeting was actually last December, wasn't it? So, but you will be retiring if that's the word one we use these days. They'll be really retired, do they? And they'll be retiring in January. So you'll be watching all this from the sidelines. Does it get a lot harder because you've caught up, you've, you've done the 300 basis points. I remember when Paul Volcker was doing all this, obviously in a totally different economic situation, he was getting people sending baseball bats through the post. To him and so on. Uh, it could be fairly unpopular if you don't manage to balance this out with not producing a recession, which is your your hope. Um, what do you think about the unpopularity that the Fed, um, your successors at the Fed, are likely to run into if these interest rate increases go on next year? And if we do have a nasty shock on the employment market. Well, it, it, as I said, I'm looking for improvement in inflation, some of that coming from improvement supply conditions, some of it coming from the uh, tighter financial conditions that monetary policy, the higher interest rate yeah. Yeah, is generating. And so I am, you know, in line with the peak funds rate as reported in the SCP at like four and a half and four and three quarters. I think that generates a real rate which will provide meaningful restraint. Again, some of what we need to bring demand in line with supply, but I'm hopeful that supply is going to expand away from some of the current COVID conditions and the uh, supply chain um, hardships and, and, and things like that. And so in that environment, this might be enough. We're going to need to be at a level fed is going to need to be at a level of restrictiveness so that they can monitor the data and see if that's right or if it's wrong and in which direction it's wrong. And um, yes, it's likely the case that six months from now, the lag effects of restrictive monetary policy should show through more to labor markets and uh, it'll be fun to understand which of those effects is strongest. Just a last question for me before uh, opening up to the audience, the effect of the very strong dollar uh, two questions there. Could that act on the US economy to produce a, a tightening effect over and above what you're seeing on the monetary side? And does it keep you awake at all at night, the fact that this is having a very deleterious uh, effect, or will do, particularly if it goes on, on emerging market economies? I know you are the bank for the United States, not for the world, but could you just put those two questions into some kind of context, please? I would expect over time, you know, if the dollar continues to be very strong, um, you know, that that would put pressure on manufacturing, that that would limit their ability to, um, to, to export for sure. I think that would, uh, you know, ease inflationary pressures to some extent, but I think there'd also be a tendency to want to look through that effect uh, to the extent that it's, it's going to be a long
So what we have understood is that the Fed will increase rates a bit more, will stay there for some time before potentially um, uh, declining rates, um, having uh, cutting rates at a later stage. Um, and then communication came from C statement and then the press conference of um, uh, uh, the chairman, uh, who mentioned, as you did today, the intention of um, the Fed of slowing down the pace of tightening at some point. That seems to me a message that is relatively dovish, uh, for the lack of a better word, or reassuring about the fact that the Fed will not keep on increasing rates at the same pace. <laughs> but then, but the market then instead took it as a very hawkish message, perhaps, um, focusing on the first part, which is that the Fed will increase rates a bit more. So what is it, the message that really the Fed wanted to give at that point in time? Well, again, I can only give you my views, but I would uh, say look at the uh, peak rate of the federal funds rate target range and, you know, what that means for real interest rates. And so, you know, subtracting off the one year ahead inflation forecast, because I think ultimately, you know, when, when you're starting off, when you're behind, you, the message is easy. Up, you know, you know where you're going. The question is, how far are you going? We are now close enough, although we're still talking really large increases, right? I mean, to get to the median SEP for the end of the year, that would be a 75 basis point increase in November and a 50 basis point increase in, in December. But you'd be very close to the peak. So I would say, how much restrictedness do you think, how much I think this to myself, how much restrictedness do I think we need in order to bring in inflation what we've got going for us is inflation expectations are still anchored. They haven't, you know, you know, gone off in crazy directions. The Phillips curve is still flat, although at the moment it's probably it, it is steeper because uh, of these labor shortages in places like manufacturing and things like that. Um, but I'm optimistic that the peak that we've set out is going to be sufficiently restrictive that that could be enough. If something else happens, we get worse inflation reports. One of the challenges is we're going up so quickly, we're not really leaving a lot of time between now and the peak to sort of assess what additional or less we're going to need. So that's a bit of the uncertainty. But I would say that the it's the peak that matters. I wouldn't, you can make an interpretation as whether or not it's dovish or hawkish, but I would say look at the peak. Well, I've got five questions uh, I've recorded already. So let's get through five, one by one, and then we'll go on to another. Uh, Krista, um, who's, of course, spent the better part of your life, better years of your life at the Fed. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, thanks, Charlie, for those initial remarks. Just sort of focusing on inflation, as it's obviously the primary issue at the moment. Between the June edition of the SEP and the September edition, the, the median view with, with which you loosely associated yourself uh, marked up the core inflation rate at the end of next year appreciably uh, to 3.1%, I believe, from 2.8 in June, in spite of adding around 100 basis points of tightening this year and 75 to the peak rate next year. That looks like a pretty big revision in the view as to how persistent these core inflation pressures are likely to be and how much work it's going to take to hammer them down. So what do you think you've learned about the persistence of core inflation pressures in that period from June till now? I think that's fair. I think, um, you know, I think the shelter prices have uh, picked up tremendously. I think the, the breadth of the price increases in the most recent reports is what was worrisome. So. When, um, when the February 2022 report came out, I keep mentioning that one because we did a lot of our discovery work on that one. You could look at 15% of the consumer core basket and take note of the fact that it was generating 20% annual inflation. And the remaining 85%, it was still at a very unhealthy 4% rate, but there was that dichotomy. To the extent that it had been maintained that it was a small 15% Okay, that might round trip, you could have more confidence in this. I think what we learned in the time period that you're pointing to is it was broader. It shows up in shelter. Shelter is undoubtedly going to take longer 
um, you know, to have that effect. The CPI is over is weighted more than the PCE. That's one reason years and years ago that then shifted to PCE. But um, um, you know, I think we um, had a sobering. I had a sobering assessment that we've got more work ahead, and um, you know, we've got a big increase in the funds rate. Still hopeful that it's not so large against an otherwise pretty good fundamentals for the U.S. economy that. You know, we can make it uh, through that, but there's still a lot of uncertainty and so many things going around geopolitical risk and other things that could knock that one way. Work ahead. So, uh, Carlos. Yeah. Carlos, you stick your microphone on it as possible. Carlos from uh, Elliott Management. Hi. I have a question on, on the structure of the U.S. economy and, and basically all economies would seem to be changing very quickly. And you're going very quickly with rate hikes. And the point was, you know, Jason Foreman, people at Peterson Institute, um, they've come back to the discussion around the 2% inflation target, whether it's actually 2% or it should be something different or you should be moving to a range. I know you had that discussion uh, when you had the strategy review and during the strategy review it was decided not to address the question of the inflation target. But it seems to be bubbling under the, you know, so the question is basically that question you could say, well, it's two, three years ahead and, you know, it's not something you need to address now. But because you're going so quickly with your rate hikes, isn't it something that you maybe have to address maybe in the next six to 12 months? Because you're going to tighten policy a lot. And fundamentally, the discussion is going to come up about are you really aiming for, you know, to get to 2% very quickly at the cost of a big recession? Or are you basically going to have a slower trend down to 2% or are you going to move to something else implicitly? How do you communicate around that and so on? Thank you. Uh, it's certainly the case that a lot of time has been spent talking about you know, two percent as an inflation objective. Why that's a, a good objective? It certainly, you know, one argument for a higher inflation objective would be that all nominal interest rates would basically price that much higher, and so in the event of a downturn, the central bank would be able to cut interest rates by more and provide more accommodation. With our two percent inflation objective, we've hit the effective lower bound um, twice almost three times when you go back to uh, you know, the 2003 experience, we, we bottomed at 1% in, in the US. Um, but, you know, and so then in order to provide more accommodation, we can asset purchases. And so you know, asset purchases provide more accommodation, but they're much more complicated. They lead to other difficulties and, um, you know, they're easy for people to misunderstand and take pot shots. And so, you know, there is the benefit of if you had a higher inflation objective that you can provide more accommodation. Now, the other side of that is we don't really have a great sense as to whether or not inflation volatility would be higher with a higher objective. There's not a really good economic model that says volatility will be higher because inflation objectives on average are higher. However, empirically, it seems to be that way. Um, I think that 2% is an inflation objective that will end up one way or another having to live with for quite a long period of time. I'm not optimistic that anybody um, is going to choose to uh, adjust that. And um, I would just say that's why the long run statement that we put out in September of 2020 was so important in stressing, because we had trouble with symmetry. I would say sometimes I look at this and kind of go, two percent is it an objective or is it a ceiling? And for the longest time, when inflation has been below two percent, you kind of go, geez, shouldn't we work harder to get it up above two percent? But one way or another, it's like I got a forecast that will take me there. Why should I work harder to do that? Then I'm disappointed. Repeat the process next year. So when we said we should average two percent over time, I think that's helpful. Um, but of course, when you have eight. And nine, of course, it gets, uh, you know, you know ridiculed. Just in the parenthesis, when you had that uh, average uh, inflation agreement, the, the statement in August 2020, what was the maximum you had in your mind of what the inflation would be, say, in 2023? Was it around 3%? I think you made statements saying we would not be afraid to have inflation at 2.5%. Your, your expectations were very limited, weren't they? I cannot speak for other policymakers. Um, my own sense. So I I thought uh, Phil curves flat, um, except for these 
I mean, this is a very unusual circumstance that we're looking at with uh, COVID shutdown, COVID rebound, supply shocks, geopolitical risks. Is that the new norm? Is that what we're going to be seeing over the next 10 years, in which case we could see higher inflation or you know, difficulties? Or are we still going to revert back to a lower trend growth environment that would be consistent with lower interest rates on average? Um, and then that, you know, could end up with lower inflation. I don't know the answer to that, but I, I, I worry that those will those problems will come around again. In that environment, I was um, quite taken with the idea that on average we want two percent, and that might very well mean when you hit the lower bound, you're going to be under two percent, and you want to make up for it on average when times are good. In that sense, I would say two and a half percent did not bother me because we'd certainly be down around one and a half percent at other times or or that. But I think that it's in the eye of the beholder, and conservative central bankers do not like to see inflation above their objective, period. And so if you think of the objective as a ceiling, that might be how they think about it. If you think that we should average it, well, maybe 2.1, 2.2. We, 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 we are in another world. But we're in another world. If, as much, if, um, can I just ask you, about, you, you might have to put your microphone on just so I'm just here. Yes. Hi, Mark from Reuters. Um, just a bit of a philosophical question. When you see uh, sterling going as fast and as low as it is at the moment, what do you think from an outside perspective? You know, obviously, as a major central bank like yourself, is it uh, how concerning is all of this? What was the last thing you said? How concerning. How concerning. You're trying to divorce your own being from the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago. You're trying to ask you, Charlie Evans, the man on the omnibus. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the US economy and, you know, and inflation, and um, I'm really not qualified to do um, open economy, central banking, like you're you know, suggesting, because we don't really suffer from that the same way. But um, I think that inflation at the moment is a worldwide problem and everybody's trying to deal with it as quickly. So I've got a couple of gentlemen from over here, but I'd like to ask the lady down here also to um, open up. And you might actually just take that back ah, there. Yes. Thank you very much. But there's, there's a whole palette of people on this, I can see that. Thank you. Good morning, Michelle Chivunga from Global Policy House. I'm really interested in your views on, we have the US-Africa Summit coming up in December. So just wondering what you think the impacts would be for emerging markets, especially in Africa with the inflation. Obviously, even in Africa, we're dealing with the, the challenge with inflation. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's a, it's a huge issue, obviously, restrictive financial conditions uh, around the globe, um, you know, make, make it very difficult for emerging market economies. I mean, at some point, um, you know, every country has to, you know, be dealing with their own issues, but also trying to take advantage of the comparative advantages that they have. And so, you know, I would hope that the development could continue to, infrastructure development could continue to, to take place, but it, it's obviously very hard. Yes, so gentlemen, they've been waiting for, yeah, please, yes, you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Tim Jones from Tata. <clears throat> One topic that, in a sense, predates uh, COVID and Ukraine was the decoupling of China and the move globally from just in time to just in case. One would imagine that that should, and we can see this in Tata now, we're doing electronics, we're doing 4G, 5G stacks, we're doing a set of industries in India. Uh, one might not have foreseen us doing back in 2017, 2018. So one would expect that that would have a drag uh, because of the, the, the pullback and globalization, the lack of efficiency from going from just in time to just in case. Do you think that pullback globally is built into people's uh, forecasts? I, I think that, you know, every corporation is asking themselves those questions, right? The resiliency of the, the supply chain and, you know, the global supply chain, obviously, and it goes back to Fukushima for sure. And, you know, other cases where you, you kind of realize, well, maybe the supply chain has gone too far, maybe recognizing that uh, China is a communist authoritarian regime. And so maybe they won't, you know, honor my investments, uh, over there the way that I would expect to see them honored in the US and things like that. We've all heard stories like that, probably had experiences um, in that case. And so, you know, that's a risk question, risk return, you know, issue. And so it's it's not surprising me to me that, you know, businesses are thinking about how to relocate it, uh, those, those supply chains and where they do business. Is it all the way to, you know, um, bring it back to your own country where it's much more expensive, but um, you know, maybe that's uh, what's important. I, I can't say I know how that will 
play out and people will make different choices, but except for the fact that you had large investments that were made, which are not paying off. I think it's healthy that businesses rethink this and um, you know, maybe we push just in time, you know, too far. Certainly when you look at the supply chain and how uh, fragile it was in, in cases, and it was like everything worked when everything worked. Right? And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, built for perfection, but not for, but yeah, I mean, the, the switch to goods, you know, goods demand was enormous. The additional fiscal support was extremely helpful and large. And so it's somehow not surprising that the supply chain wasn't necessarily sized to, to that level. And yet when I hear, well, you can't find truck drivers, I've been hearing that for years and years and years. Just stay on that kind of for a moment, and then we'll go on to the gentleman in the fourth row. But can you find truck drivers in Europe? We are we are importing truck drivers from Poland. That makes the uh, original policy, which is not uh, true. But you've got a very strong uh, manufacturing hub in Chicago, where you are based. And is it the manufacturers there who are, in fact, pushing the administration now to be tougher on China, or is the administration? Taking the lead in terms of this uh, reshoring or friend shoring and so on, uh, which we've heard about from the administration. I can't say I know about the, the business push in certain areas. I mean, you know, Chicago is very large, but very big in logistics, uh, all the transportation, you know, sort of railways and highways. And stuff. Okay, well, we'll leave that one, uh, please. And then there's another gentleman next to you, and there's a couple down here. It seems my name is AJ Dial from Claybridge Investments. It seems to me that there was a, a slow response mechanism to the data that you were using. Has there been a, a discussion and debate about the quality and the high frequency of the data that you can actually access around inflation that would have given you a quicker stimulus, right? And effectively a quicker mechanism to make decisions? Um, you know, we are always questioning the the data that we have and the sources. Certainly, you know, once COVID hit and we're totally different economy, right? We all of a sudden started accessing you know, real time data sources, uh, you know, mobile mobility data and things like that. So we, we've really taken on a tremendous amount of new data. Pricing data, you know, there's always been. I forget it started off as the MIT million you know, goods pricing, and I forget where it is now, but uh, you know, there's some kind of wedge that's more goods than it is everything else that's in the inflation uh, indices themselves. And so people are always trying to do translations to you know how that helps. It just turns out that inflation has always been among, if not the most difficult to forecast variable. I think exchange rates are right up there too. Um, and but are you talking about things like uh, GDP data that you might get from, say, credit card transactions and so on? Is that what you mean? Like, but yeah, this kind of real time data that will maybe improve maybe the speed of the transmission. I mean, you always think that more data ought to help you, but no, no, not necessarily. I mean, so the inflation movements take place, except when they're big supply things, slowly and over long periods of time, right? So it's really hard to find things. To grab that. If you knew that we were in a new environment where supply shocks were going to hit it all the time, I'll bet you could find some of those uh, more variable indicators that would help you out then. But you know, then you'd be stuck when it stopped working. This is the gentleman who's uh, along here. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Albert from Le Monde, the French newspaper. Um, you just ask yourself a question, saying, you know, "Is it a new norm we are in?" Um, and you said, "You know, after 40 years of low inflation." Do you think that there is a reason that we are we have moved to a higher inflation for a longer time, or is it just a series of shocks that just happened at the same time, one after the other? Well, I think there's been a series of shocks that's pushed relative prices in big ways, and I think that that only gets embedded in long-term inflation if the monetary authority accommodates it. I think the current state of central banks is. Um, Definitely um, on the conservative side. I mean, if you think back to uh, big debates about um, uh, macroeconomics and inflation in the 70s, a lot of this came down to shouldn't the central bank follow a rule because discretionary monetary policy injects an inflationary bias because of that. And I always remember Ken Rogoff from Harvard saying, well, you know, that depends on preferences of central bankers. If you have a conservative 
central banker doing discretionary policy, they're not going to lead to inflation. They're going to have a preference you know, for something less. And so I think we have an appropriate uh, appreciation for the costs of uh, unexpected volatile inflation and central banks are all over that. I think it's been a very um, unusual set of circumstances that we face. There's been you know, perhaps misperceptions of what we were facing, but it's very clear coming out of uh, the Jackson Hole Conference in uh, August that central bankers are all over the inflation uh, situation and they will be making adjustments appropriately. That's in a way my point. So was there a collective moment lately in April or May or June when figuratively the central bankers of the world went into a cold sweat at night and said, hang on a moment, we're losing this. And unless we do actually show our resolution, in an expeditious way, as you've been putting it, we're going to lose the battle. People will not think we're committed to inflation. I think it's about another way so far as to say the very bedrock of faith in the European Central Bank could be undermined. I don't think you'd go as far as that. But was there not a collective wake up? Well, this is a bit like Christian's question earlier when he said, What's different between the June SEP and the most recent SEP? And we've had a big increase in the, the funds rate path. And I think central banks around the world, you know, have, collectively taking that on board. Uh, but it's also that the data have revealed themselves to be much worse than we were expecting. And so um, did I have a bad forecast of inflation? I guess I did. You know, that's almost, you know. I'm not trying to escape you to say it was on May the 21st, but when do you think this uh, <laughs> well, change in perception took place? Every month the CPI comes out, you look at it, you go, oh my gosh, expecting it to get better. Okay. Okay. We, we had a period in July where we got a better inflation report. And when you're looking for some of that to be transitory and you see it, then the next one it's undone. Okay, well, we're really starting to get going now. We've got uh, six or seven questions, but the first of all, uh, then we're done here, please. Thank you. Uh, Martin Watkins from Montes. Uh, I'm picking up on the fact that uh, on 5th, I've got a digital monetary institute set up and thinking about uh, the infrastructure that's required for digital securities, the, the regulated side. And I'm just wondering, in your medium to long term projections, what factors, if any, do you bring into consideration around the challenges to fiat currency and also the digital journey that we're going on? It's fair to say that central banks are studying digital currencies. Some are working on them. The Federal Reserve put out a white paper not long ago where we mostly sort of pointed to issues that we need to think through more carefully. I would say at the moment, certainly in my own outlook, I don't take much of that into account as affecting the, the inflation environment. And uh, um, but you know, it's an, an exciting potential innovation. So please over here, and then the gentleman uh, Anna behind you. In fact, three over there. But first of all, yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, as I am a Central Bank of Turkey, and thank you for your remarks. Really, it's helpful. Right. So the supply shock is not easy to decide how long it will persist and will be with us. That makes our task really difficult. But there are some tools. Let me remind you that there are page book, for example, that you know release, or there are some business survey which really helps to minimize, you know, because you, know, you just collect the data from the first hand, from the business, you know, they know how long will this shocks. So my question is, do you think that the quality of this survey needed to be improved or maybe most of the central bank didn't pay attention to this survey and, you know, in order to, you know, decide whether this and, you know, how long will, I know it's difficult, but at least there are some information. This is my question. A second, there could we just have one question? Sure, sure, sure. I, mean, I do think that uh, you know survey data have been extremely useful. Um, you know, business uh, convers uh, conversations I had with biz business people, which we do, you know, routinely. That's one of the benefits of having twelve reserve banks spread around uh, the country. I'd say they have been extraordinarily useful in the current and period. Current period, just you know, COVID. Everybody's. You know, talking about what are you doing? You know, we're working remotely. How are you doing? You know, that and trading information, very, very useful. How are you getting employees back into the office? Well, it's kind of uneven. You know, I mean, you start a conversation like that, everybody listens, right? And everybody's comparing those prices. 
I mean, that's a harder one, you know? I mean, if, if I start a conversation with business people about prices, they, they'll start talking and then they'll kind of, you know, this hasn't happened to me, but I've heard stories, you know, way, way in the past, of, kind of like somebody goes, if I start talking about price increases, you're going to think there's inflation and then you're going to respond, um, you know, to that. I mean, businesses are extremely careful about their pricing decisions, right? I mean, just, you know, because they're competing and cost pressures and why are they able to pass along and get price increases? For the longest time, they haven't been able to do that. Now we're going through a period where they are able to do that. If you catch you know, I know some small business people who in an unguarded moment, but they're retired and I kind of go, whenever I had a chance to raise prices, I always made sure I could get just as much as I could because I knew I wasn't going to get much more out of that. There's, there's an entire, you know, ecosystem of, of how this takes place. Then there's the, the macroeconomics and, you know, the aggregate, you know, conditions that, that apply that. So, you know, there are many reasons to kind of think there could be some noise around some of the developments and it takes a while to develop it before we see exactly the aggregate consequences. But you know, I think the competition is going to reassert itself. Um, I think that, you know, as costs go up, people are going to work hard to, you know, reduce those costs, to improve their competitiveness, to, to get, you know, better with market share and things like that. So, you know, I think that'll be a more productive time period. In that little triangle up there, we've got the gentleman sitting next to Anna, and then we'll have you, Anna. The person with your question, please, sir. Moshe Shah from Goldman Sachs. When you think about this tightening cycle, um, how do you think about the balance between rate hikes and QT? Um, you know, arguably, you could, tighter, uh, you could tighten financial conditions more easily by doing more on the balance sheet. So we're running off our you know, assets now, and it's a, it's, it's a pretty steep pace. Of course, we purchased them at a pretty steep pace uh, as well. Um, I think that the QT is probably adding something like 35 to 50 basis points of additional restrictiveness on top of that peak federal funds rate. Um, and so if I think that next year, the peak would be four and a half to four and three quarters, I'd add 50 basis points to think about, I got some restrictiveness in there. I think if you get to a point where you see inflation falling while you're sitting at that peak funds rate and inflation's going down, you're getting more restrictive again, because the real rate's going up and you're still doing the runoff from, from QT. So I think that's the point at which you kind of go, have I seen inflation come down enough? Is it clear and convincing? Is this getting us to where we want to be on the right time frame? I think those are some of the questions that are going to, you know, make the individual, you know, participant, policy participants kind of go, yeah, maybe this is the time to, to reduce it, or maybe this is the time to just make sure we get on top of inflation and, and bring it down. I, I don't know how that will play out. Well, thank you for mentioning QT. Um, let's have Anna, and then one of your shorter questions, please. And then there's just three more questions. And we are running out of time, I'm afraid. But please, have a succinct question. Thanks very much. I'll try to be brief. Um, it seems like we're using fiscal policy and regulatory policy a lot more in dealing with a lot of the shocks and changes that are coming up. And so I wonder what you think is the you know, correct balance, maybe, of roles and responsibilities and maybe the balance of power between monetary policy and those other areas of policy. Thank you. Um, I mean, those are very important considerations. I think uh, if I think back to the aftermath of the great financial crisis in the United States and back in 2011, when the fiscal discussion was about austerity policies, and I think, you know, here in the UK, it was very similar in other places, that was not supportive of the stronger aggregate demand that we needed in order to get employment going, get the economy going. And so monetary policy had to do more. And when you're at the effective lower bound, that meant we did QE2, we did monetary um, maturity extension program, and then opened into QE3. So um, matching fiscal policy with what is needed so that monetary policy can focus on getting inflation to its 2% objective without having to run up um, a large balance sheet that people don't understand very well. Um, you know, that, that's a plus. <laughs> Regulatory policies, not sure what you have in mind exactly. I would say in the US, I think there have been, you know, there was Dodd-Frank and so there was the, you know, emphasis on more and better capital and you know, additional requirements for um, the largest uh, financial institutions and all of that. There was sort of a pendulum swinging the other way to right size 
uh, financial institutions that didn't meet that same risk profile and things like that. So um, financial stability is very important. So I kind of look to the regulatory side to set that as best it can, because if I have to think about financial instability risk in the setting of monetary policy, it might be at odds with our dual mandate objectives. Well, thank you. We've got three questions. I'm going to ask people to put these, uh, uh, lump them together, so not consecutively, but all together. And so I should be more concise myself. myself. No, no, not at all. I'm just relying on you to, to be able to remember the questions. First of all, gentlemen, we'll pull over. I think you had a question. Did you have I've um, probably forgotten. Could you put your microphone on? Sorry. And then in the row there, and then um, Patrick Perry Green on my own um, macro consultancy. Um, one of the things, so Chair Powell talks about the policy in his present last week, talked about how policy was only just restrictive. However, when we look at financial conditions, uh, the, the, the rate of change is the greatest since 2008. Which also brings me back to the, the CEF forecast, because we actually we look back at the CEF forecast over the past 15 years, the track record is pretty abysmal. What? In terms of what well, you think about the rate prospects and the growth forecast and the inflation was always going to come up. And then I was last night I was actually looking at the June 08 forecasts. And you we see the financial conditions. From us, uh, oh, uh, difficulty yeah. of getting to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, let, 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 I think so the, question, the question was. Well, the point. The point is, is, is not right. It doesn't seem to me that enough enough attention. We're talking about the mass of rate hikes, i.e., nominal rates, but we've been used to a zero rate environment. So three percent now is very different to three percent in ninety five or eighty nine or stuff like that. So it's the rate of change where people become used to expectations of their interest rate payments, be it companies or households. And the other side of it is just the sheer speed of it. So policy acts with long lags, as we're constantly told by Jay Powell. So uh, is there a risk that enough has happened in terms of the financial, tightening financial conditions already to actually have a disproportionate impact in the first half of next year? Yeah, I think we get the message. Uh, and yes, please. And, and we'll try to give you space for a really mega serial answer. Uh, yeah, so. Um, Jonathan Betty from New York Obama. Uh, you'd be aware that the ECB's uh, asset purchase program now incorporates climate and green considerations as the Fed delevers and basically goes through tightening. Does that end the debate about whether the Fed should consider other considerations in asset purchases beyond uh, being neutral as to the sectors and activities of the underlying businesses? We only buy treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And within MBS, of course, there are different options in terms of what the agencies designate between the, the green characteristics. And there is, as you know, a debate on whether that should change. But do you think that debate is now over in the current context? And the final question, thank you for your patience. Martin Wheel from King's College, London. Could I ask you whether there was any sense that a fear of a sustained deflation was a factor at the Federal Reserve Board that impeded tightening of monetary policy. Certainly, if I think of my own experience at the Bank of England, there was a deflationary skeleton in the cupboard that was brought out from time to time to frighten the MPC. I wondered whether you had any sense of analogy of that. Thank you. I mean, <clears throat> I think there was a time when uh, inflation stepped down, you know, to like 1%. And, um, and growth was uh, weak and uh, aggregate demand wasn't wasn't that good. I, I wouldn't if there was ever you know concern about deflation. It was very early after Lehman Brothers when many models would kind of say we've got such a high unemployment rate. This you know looks like it should be negative inflation. But I would say that for a long period of time, under running our inflation objective was a you know big bogey that I was concerned about and you know except in the cases that, you, that someone mentioned it's like well the SCP kind of saw inflation getting up to you know two percent within two years and so good enough and then you're disappointed because it didn't happen and then it's like well next year it'll be good enough and you roll that forward but I don't, I don't think we really were overly concerned about inflation this inflation yes um uh, the green MBS, I uh, don't really have any information on that. The way you describe it, I, I don't know who's thinking about that. It seems to be very much an ECB, ECB thing, doesn't it? It's not a Fed thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
No, 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 no. That, that was right. 2008. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't report the dot. We didn't report the dot plot. So that that, that can go back to Humphrey Hawkins when twice a year we put together forecasts, which were never, you know, all that good. Um, the, the benefit of the SCP is not the real forecast as much as it is here's what people are thinking about for for, for rates for policy and whether or not they're expecting it to be restrictive or not. That's why the person in charge of the press conference, the chair, Ranky, Yellen, Powell. They don't want to be bothered by the dots when they're not helpful, which is most of the time. But every now and then, they're extremely helpful, and this is one of those periods. The 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 rate of change in the policy rate. How does it compare to other moments? Because we used to have low rates. I mean, question. I'll I'll, I'll first come back to. In the current environment, I'm trying to figure out what the real rate is going to the level of the rate that's going to be restrictive enough. And so I have to compute a real rate. And I've got to do it with forecasts in mind for inflation because we're in a period where it needs to be the forward looking inflation. But we'll never get a real rate that's positive if I have to do the 12 month trailing. Well, not for quite a long time. And the, the appropriate concept for the real rate is the inflation expectation. We just haven't always done it that way because there wasn't that much difference but you're reminding me of something that i read and i just don't have a great feel for this but it's kind of like um high interest rates in the bulker period were not necessarily that much more taxing restrictive for households than what we may be facing how much lower leave that Exactly, the leverage, the leverage and the borrowing and the debt and all of that is, um, is, is, so we need to take that into account and make a judgment as to how that's holding things back. Um, I'm not usually favorably inclined towards arguments about rate of change of asset purchases versus the level, but of course, in December 2000, it's like, it's like, well, anybody under the age of 40, not know that they have a higher interest rate environment is. It basically, you know, go back to '98. So if you think about anybody who's already bought a house, first of home since then, there's been not just that. Businesses have also conditioned themselves to a relatively low proportion of expenditure going toward allocated towards debt service, and all of a sudden that model is shifted to massive. The governments as well, of course, in the last. Yeah. Well, well so, so a history degree is going to be more highly valued. That's <laughs> <best thing. laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, you've got all this free time on your hands after January, Charlie. So, uh, is there a book coming out of this? <laughs> I, I don't think the letter do your memoirs, but people do write books, certainly from time to time. I would have to do some more research before I. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you love it, ever do become a commentator on the ECB, I think you should try to persuade them that they should. Probably something like a dot plot. I think that is very much needed actually. So you could join forces with one or two of the fellows around here to ask the ECB to be a bit more transparent about some of their future thinking. That would be a great service to send to I fear I'm an outlier in this. Um, you know, you can probably go to some of my uh, colleagues in the Federal Reserve, ask them their you know sympathies of the dot plot. You could get a I'd like to get rid of it. I kind of go, I, I view this as showing your work, you know, it's like the, Rather than just looking up the answer in the back of the book, you know, I'm sure you want to. Well, thank you for putting it like that. Well, thank you for taking us through this uh, mystery tour of the US monetary policy. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.